Hey Optomancers, Tree and Monk here, and today we continue our trek into wizard spells. We're going to be doing our 8th level spell guide today. Uh, next week I'll be bringing you my 9th level spell guide. It's probably the only video I'll be releasing next week uh, because I'm actually on vacation, so I'm going to go ahead and maybe get it ready to go, and I'll have it released at some point during next week. Uh, and then the following week, we'll be getting into our wizard builds. Uh, so let's start with our 8th level spells. We're going to be doing, as usual, school by school. I'll be listing from my favorite to my least favorite for each school. And I'll be using my standard color guide, which is red if I don't recommend the spell, orange if I think the spell is overly circumstantial, purple if I think it's an okay spell, uh, and then green if I think it's a good spell and I'm recommending it, and blue if I think it's an amazing spell that you really have to think hard if you don't want to take it. So, all that said, let's get started. So starting off with our Abjuration School, my favorite Abjuration spell with 8th level spells is Mind Blank. Uh, now Mind Blank is one of those spells that it isn't a huge effect a lot of the time because what it does is you cast it and for a 24 hour period either yourself or a creature you choose uh, is going to have immunity to all kinds of things. They're going to have immunity to the charmed condition, they're going to have immunity to any kind of reading of thoughts, reading of emotions, or any divination spells. Somebody with a mind blank who casts an invisibility, for example, can't be detected with a see invisibility spell. Now technically, something like blind sense might still be able to detect an invisible creature even with a mind blank, because that's not a divination spell and it's not something specifically covered under the mind blank effect. But it is going to protect you against a lot of things and it's a complete protection. And there's no way around it. Even a wish spell can't penetrate a mind blank. Not that you would probably be using wish spells to read somebody's mind anyway, but it is written specifically under the spell that you can't use a wish spell even for those kinds of things. So for the things that mind blank prevents, it is foolproof. But there aren't a huge number of effects that it blocks. Uh, but it doesn't use concentration and it lasts 24 hours. So if you're going to use your 8th level slot and you use it on a mind blank, it is going to be really good at preventing certain things. However, the downside is some days you're never going to be targeted with the divination effect or a charm effect. And then the mind blank didn't do you any good at all. And remember, because we're talking about an eighth level spell, you're only having one slot. So if you cast mind blank, that's it. You're done with your eighth level spells. So I would be careful about when I use it. I'd be using it either if I don't have any other 8th level spells that are really exciting me or I'm really excited to cast, or if I expect to maybe be targeted by divination or charm. Still, because the mind blank is so effective at those things, I really recommend you should consider putting it on your list, and then when you do need it, you're going to prepare it and you're going to cast it. So the next spell I want to talk about at 8th level with Abjuration is Anti-Magic Field. But I think it's one of those spells that I don't mind having, I don't mind preparing it, but you got to be really careful before you use it because Anti-Magic Field will shut down all magic, including yours, within a 10-foot radius area centered around you. Now it's concentration and it lasts for a full hour, uh, but I can't see really using it for an hour in most cases. Uh, maybe if you're trying to get around some kind of magical effect that's persistent around an area, you might want to do it. Uh, Otherwise, most of the time when you use an anti-magic field, it's usually to shut down some magic user or a caster that is maybe more powerful than you. Uh, so you cast the anti-magic field and then you can end up right beside them and then they can't really do a lot unless they can get out of your radius. And that's something you need to be careful about. If you just cast a spell and then run up to an enemy caster, they could just potentially move out of the area and still cast spells, not at you, because none of the spells they cast will be able to penetrate the anti-magic field. But what you really want to do is you want to be working with your other party members. So if you have a caster you're trying to shut down, you would cast the anti-magic field and then maybe your barbarian is going to grapple that caster. Uh, and then they really can't do anything and they can't cast spells to get out of it. And you can defeat very powerful casters using that combination. 
So what Anti-Magic Sphere does is it's a suppression effect. So any spell that comes within the area of the Anti-Magic Field is suppressed. So if you cast a Fireball outside an Anti-Magic Field, that Fireball will still occur, but any area that would have entered the Anti-Magic Field doesn't. Uh, if a summoned creature enters an Anti-Magic Field, it's winked out of existence as long as you maintain the spell. But should you lose concentration or drop the spell, it would reappear. Even magic items are uh, suppressed by the effect. So your longsword plus three is now a regular longsword until you remove the anti-magic field effect. So this, remember, it can affect things like attacking creatures that maybe have resistances or immunities to non-magical weapons. They might be a lot harder to defeat if you are dealing with an anti-magic field. So in the end, this does end up being a circumstantial spell. Uh, do I think it's overly circumstantial that it should be an orange rating? I think the effect is so powerful, and casters and magical effects are becoming reasonably common, certainly at high levels, uh, and those effects are very powerful. So there's lots of cases where I could see considering using an anti-magic field. So I'm going to give it a purple rating, uh, but again, before you cast an anti-magic field, just think about it carefully, because it is likely as a wizard that if you cast an anti-magic field, there's not much you're going to be able to do. So talking about our conjuration spells, our first spell we're going to talk about is Maze. Maze is probably my favorite 8th level spell in D&D. So the way Maze works is you're going to target one creature and it is going to disappear. It's not going to get a saving throw. So it's a little bit like Banishment, take away the saving throw. Uh, which is amazing because, of course, the saving throw is the one thing about Banishment that kind of makes me iffy about that spell. Take that away, it's a great spell. Uh, but with a Maze, you're going to have a 10 minute duration instead of a 1 minute duration. So it's going to last a long time too. Finally, the creature that you banish into the maze uh, gets an ability check to recover. So they can make an intelligence check on their turn, uh, and they need a DC of 20 to come back. Now, it's not a saving throw, so if they have legendary resistance, it's not going to do them any good. Not going to do them any good because they don't get initial save, and they never get a saving throw with this spell. So legendary resistance doesn't help you at all with this spell. So it's really appropriate for the level in which you get maze. Uh, and if you look at all kinds of creatures in the game, most of them aren't going to make a DC 20 intelligence check very easy, if at all. A lot of them have no chance of making that save, and then you can basically have the 10 minute duration. When you drop your concentration, or or the 10 minutes is up, then the creature will reappear in the space it disappeared in. So often we can plan this. We're going to have a big tough creature and a bunch of minions. We get rid of the big tough creature, we clear out the minions, uh, then we can prepare all kinds of things, and once we're ready, and everyone's surrounding the area, we know exactly when they'll come back, and we know exactly where they'll come back. And so, although it doesn't always make a combat easy, it can often guarantee you the win in the combat, and that's kind of the biggest thing anyway. Finally, remember that if you are a conjurer and you cast Maze, uh, your concentration cannot be interrupted because a conjurer, of course, by this level, can't lose concentration from taking damage. So if you're a conjurer, this spell is really, really amazing, but for every wizard, this is a really good choice and something you should strongly consider for your 15th or higher level wizard. My next favorite conjuration spell at level 8 is Demiplane. Uh, now Demiplane has a lot of different uses, uh, and if you're creative you can probably come up with more than I'm going to mention here now. Uh, but basically, when you cast Demiplane, what you do is you create a door. Uh, it is, the door will last for one hour, and it connects from whatever plane you're on to a Demiplane. So a Demiplane is just kind of this little pocket plane uh, that for the most part, you can only access. Uh, it is going to have dimensions up to 30 feet by 30 feet by 30 feet, so it's not infinite space, but it is a reasonable size. Uh, and then what happens after the one hour, the door disappears. So what do we use this for? Number one, it's a perfectly safe uh, rest place. So you can go there, uh, you cast your demiplane spell, you enter the demiplane, the door disappears, and you are completely safe. And that can be as long as you want. Might be an hour, might be 24 hours, might be a week. Uh, it is really up to you. But remember, when you're in the demiplane, there's not going to be anything there other than what you brought with you. Now I should add in here that if you cast a demiplane spell uh, as a place to rest or as a home base, 
uh, so that you go into the demiplane spell and then you let the door disappear, uh, you will need another way out of the demiplane. Uh, the demiplane spell itself wouldn't get you back out because it would just take you to another demiplane. Uh, it can't connect you back to the prime material plane. Uh, but there's lots of ways you can deal with that. The easiest one would be to have a plane shift spell. If you have a plane shift spell, you just take everyone and then you leave whenever you want. Uh, the other way you could maybe do it is something like with the banishment spell. So uh, somebody's banished back to the prime material plane and then they cast the demi plane to open up the door again. Uh, one way or the other, uh, as long as you plan ahead, it shouldn't be a problem. The second thing you can use it for is perfectly safe storage. Uh, you've probably been on adventures where the DM describes some kind of pile of treasure and then points out that you probably can't carry it or you probably can't carry it for very far. Well, if you have a demi plane, that changes because you can just shove all that stuff in the demi plane. And then when you get back to your home base, you cast the demi plane again and then you can pull it all back out again. Uh, so then you can transport things over any distance. And speaking of transporting things, then you can do that as well with creatures. So if we have a large number of creatures that will fit in a 30 by 30 foot room, so there's some limits there, but things like horses, that kind of thing, uh, you know, maybe you enter a dungeon and your mount can't go, so you're going to put your mount in the demi plane, and then once you're through that area, then you can cast it again and bring your mount back out wherever you happen to be. In addition, you can use it as something like a prison. So maybe there's a prisoner and you want to have them completely safe, but also impervious from getting away. So you cast the demi plane, you put them in the demi plane, and then you can access that demi plane when you want, and they should be there, unless they have some kind of plane or travel. So lots of different ways to use this spell, and you can use them all. Uh, so I really do like the demi plane spell because it is very versatile, even though it doesn't necessarily have a combat impact, uh, and there's a certain amount of circumstantiality there. But overall, I think there's so many different things you can do with this that are pretty effective that I think it is a good spell to take. My next favorite conjuration spell at this level is Mighty Fortress. Uh, now, Morden Canyon's Magnificent Mansion actually fills a lot of the requirements or fills a lot of the needs that Mighty Fortress would do. Uh, so what Mighty Fortress does, instead of creating an extra dimensional space, it creates an actual fortress in the plane you're in. Otherwise, it is a, very similar to Morden Canyon's Magnificent Mansion in that it's furnished however you want, it has servants, it has lots of food in it, and it is well defended. Not as well defended as Morden Canyon's Magnificent Mansion, uh, but still, it's got turrets, it has stone walls, it has stone doors in the outer wall, uh, so it is well defendable. Now this spell has two things that Morgan Cain's Magnificent Mansion doesn't have. The first is when you cast it, it lasts for seven days. So we could cast it before an adventure and we have a home base near where the adventure is going to appear and it is a defendable home base that is has everything we need in it. Uh, the second thing is, is if we cast this spell every seven days for a year, it's permanent. So this is a way we could create a permanent and pretty good uh, home base. But remember, to do that, we would need a year's worth of downtime, or at least enough downtime that we can cast this once every seven days for a year. Uh, so that's a pretty big limitation. I mean, we have campaigns that maybe only go for a year. Uh, so in those cases, being able to do this as a permanent effect isn't going to do you any good at all. And if you're moving around a lot, having a home base that's stuck in one place, I mean, we can teleport there. We could create a teleportation circle there. But of course, we could always just use a Mordenkainen's Magnificent Mansion or even a Leoman's Tiny Hut for pretty safe long rests uh, and using lower level slots or no slots at all. So I think this becomes a circumstantial spell. Uh, really good for creating a base if we have a large number of creatures really good for creating a base if we have long periods of downtime. But if neither of those are the case, then I think we're probably better served with lower level spells. My least favorite conjuration spell at 8th level is Incendiary Cloud. Now I don't think it's necessarily a terrible spell, but it has some problems. Uh, so it creates a cloud that's 20 foot radius, so that's about the size of a fireball. Uh, except it is a cloud, and it requires a concentration, and it is an effect that lasts for up to a minute. When somebody enters the effect for the first time or they end their turn there, they take 10d8 damage. So we can expect about 45 points of damage, half on a successful saving throw. Now, I'm not big on the end its turn there effect because creatures often can leave the effect. 
because it's not evocation, evokers are not going to get sculpt spells. They're not going to get empowered evocation if they use it. Uh, but no matter what wizard uses it, the damage is kind of moderate for the level. Now, if you can get a bunch of creatures in there for multiple turns, that it changes because 20d8 is great damage for this level. So if you figure you can get more than one round of damage, then it becomes reasonably good. And the thing about this effect is it moves. It moves at 10 feet per round away from you in a direction you choose. Now, away from you and in, in a direction you choose would seem to me to be mutually exclusive, but the spell says both of those things. Uh, so I would assume that we can pick any direction as long as it's away from us and it would continue in that direction. So then it's just going to continue 10 feet around as we go. Uh, so what's often going to happen is you might cast it on enemies and then it's going to move further away and it's going to be even easier for those enemies to get out of the effect before the end of their round. So I think it's going to be pretty hard to get creatures in there for more than one round uh, unless there are specific circumstances that would prevent them from moving for example uh, or if we're maybe like clearing out a town or something where 10 to 8 is lots of damage to take out the enemies we could potentially take out large numbers out of an army or things like that we always have these spells that i say aren't very good and then people say oh but they would do so much to an army Yep, an incendiary cloud wouldn't be a bad thing to throw against a large army, and you would get lots of creatures stuck in it. Uh, wouldn't take out the army, of course, uh, but it might take out many creatures before the effect ended. Uh, but in general, I think there's just too much wrong with this spell, uh, because it's going to be really hard to hit creatures for more than one round with it, and because of that, we're really only looking at 45 points of damage, save for half, with an 8th level spell, which isn't great damage, and it's using our concentration. And because it's not an evocation spell, even our blaster specialist can't really make the best use of this. So overall, I think, circumstantially, this could be okay, but I think it's the weakest spell on the conjuration list. So with divination, there are no divination 8th level spells, so if you are a diviner, there's nothing you can do with that. Uh, that brings us into our enchantment spells. So my favorite enchantment spell for 8th level is Antipathy Sympathy. Now Antipathy Sympathy lasts for 10 days and doesn't use your concentration. So it's a huge duration uh, that doesn't use concentration. So ideally this is something we're going to cast before we begin our adventure so that we can recover our 8th level slot before this ever comes into effect. And what this does is you're going to cast it on a creature and then you can pick a creature type and that creature type is either going to be attracted or repelled by that creature for that duration. So if you do the antipathy effect, uh, if a creature comes within a 60 foot radius area of the creature that has this spell, then there is a wisdom save or the creature is frightened. Uh, if it's the sympathy effect, uh, then they make a wisdom save or they're compelled to come closer to the creature that you cast it on. So. The idea here is what you can do is maybe if you have a tank in your party, you can cast Sympathy, and then the creatures would be attracted to the tank. Well, if you have somebody like yourself, the lovely wizard who doesn't want to get in melee, then you could cast Antipathy, and then they're repelled from you. Uh, and you could potentially stack these effects because we have a 10-day duration, because we don't have to concentrate on it. Uh, but the issue is it's only working on one creature type. So... If you know what you're going up against, I know that what I'm going to be going up against are uh, Ogre Magi. Well, then I can specifically cast a spell for those. But if I don't know what I'm going up against, then you're really talking about guesswork. Now, I'd say if you really don't know, but you're going to have a chance to cast a spell, maybe do Humanoid. Uh, that seems to be the most common enemy that I come across. Uh, and that's probably the best guess you're going to get. Uh, but if you know what you're going to be facing, then this is a pretty good spell because we can really kind of control the battlefield with it. And it is an extra effect that we're adding on to all the other great stuff we can do. Uh, pulling enemies towards the people we want to pull them towards and keeping them away from the people we want to keep them away from. So overall, I think a really good spell, but it does require that preparation before the adventure begins to be worth that 8th level slot. My next favorite enchantment spell at this level is Dominate Monster. Dominate Monster is generally the kind of spell that I have a bias against because we're going to pick a creature, cast the spell 
they're going to make a wisdom saving throw. If they make it, nothing happens. If they have legendary resistance and you cast dominate monster at them, expect them to use their legendary resistance to stop the dominate spell. Uh, if you cast this in combat, they have advantage on their saving throw. So really don't expect it to work in combat. But if we maybe sneak up and cast on somebody before combat begins uh, and they don't have legendary resistance and they fail their saving throw, then this is pretty good because it's concentration for one hour and you basically, you've charmed the target, but you also have a telepathic link to them and you can issue them commands that require no action from you that they will complete to the best of their ability. Furthermore, if you want to use your action, you can take direct control over that uh, enemy or creature that you've dominated and then you can precisely uh, control their actions. Uh, so in terms of what happens if you land this spell, it's really, really good. It's just hard to land, so I don't love it. Now remember, if you're an enchanter, you can twin this for free. Uh, so then suddenly for an enchanter, I'd say this is green at least, maybe even blue. Uh, for all other casters, I think this is an okay spell just because the effect, if you land it, is so, so good. Now we can upcast this with a ninth level spell, then we would get an eight hour duration. I'm not sure I would still use a ninth level spell on this just because ninth level spells are so, so good. But if you are playing some kind of multi-class and you're just not gonna achieve ninth level spells, but you're gonna have a ninth level slot, then this might be a candidate for upcasting. Though I will say, uh, in general, if you're making a build and you're going to put some thought into that build, I would never make a build that's going to achieve 8th level spells and ninth level slots, uh, because that is going to be so disappointing when the other people in the party can cast real ninth level spells and you're casting upcast 8th level spells. My next favorite enchantment spell at this level is Feeble Mind. Uh, now, the advantage of Feeble Mind over, say, a Dominate Monster is number one, if we cast it in combat, they don't have advantage on their saving throw, and number two, it's going to target intelligence. However, there are some downsides to Feeble Mind we should talk about. The first and most important is the effect it has isn't going to affect everything, uh, because what it does is it's going to make you stupid, right? And then you can't cast spells, you can't activate magic items, you can't communicate. There are a lot of creatures that you can cast Feeble Mind on, and they're still going to keep fighting, and you're not really going to notice a difference. Uh, it's really going to make an effect on spellcasters. So we cast it on enemy clerics or wizards or that kind of thing. Of course, if we cast it on an enemy wizard, then maybe targeting intelligence isn't such a big bonus anymore. Uh, and that's part of the problem, is that the creatures that already have a terrible intelligence are the ones that are most likely to fail their saving throw here. Uh, now, if we look at just the specific stats of things in the uh, Monster Manual, we're going to find that even creatures that have a lot of magical abilities and aren't stupid may not have a great intelligence saving throw anyway. It's certainly going to probably be less than the constitution saving throw in most cases. So targeting intelligence still is probably a good thing, but it's maybe not as great a thing as we've seen with some other spells because some of the targets uh, that we would really want to hit with an intelligence save are not the targets that Feeble Mind is going to give us the right effect for. Uh, so I would say that this ends up being more circumstantial than something like a Dominate Monster. So I'm going to give it an orange rating. But again, remember, if you are an enchanter, I would still consider preparing it. Just because, you, again, you can do it to two different targets. My least favorite enchantment spell at this level is Power Word Stun. And the reason it's my least favorite is because it's hard to stick. Uh, when we cast Power Word Stun, we're going to pick a creature, and if that creature is within 60 feet and has 150 hit points or less, then it is stunned. No saving throw. Uh, it doesn't even require concentration from you. Then on following turns, it gets a constitution saving throw to break the effect. And honestly, constitution saving throw is exactly what they want, uh, so I wouldn't necessarily expect the stun effect to last a long time. But as long as they have that 150 or less, you're guaranteed at least one round of effect. The problem there is, do you know when the creature has less than 150 hit points? Well, you have to guess. And we're at 15th level, so a lot of the creatures we're fighting are going to have many hundreds of hit points. And guessing when it gets to 150 might be really difficult. The other thing is, once it gets to 150, the battle might be really close to over anyways. 
we have characters who can maybe do that much damage with a couple rounds of attack. Or the rest of the party might be able to do that much damage with one round of attack. So is it that big a deal? Is it worth casting an 8th level spell to help finish off a target that's mostly finished off already? Uh, so this becomes the most circumstantial of the circumstantial spells in enchantment. And overall, it is my least favorite of those spells. So this brings us into our evocation spells. And the first evocation spell, probably my favorite at this level, they don't really love any of these evocation spells, but my favorite of them is Maddening Darkness. Uh, so Maddening Darkness, if we compare it to Incendiary Cloud, I think is way better. Uh, Maddening Darkness fills a much, much bigger area and it lasts much, much longer. Also, creatures will be taking the damage at the beginning of their turn instead of the end of their turn, and it doesn't move. So all kinds of ways I think Maddening Darkness is better than Incendiary Cloud. Uh, but there are still some downsides here. This spell is doing 8d8 points of damage uh, to creatures within it at the beginning of their turn. That's not a lot of damage for this level. And because this is a Darkness spell, of 8th level, we would need a ninth level light creating spell in order to illuminate this area. So this darkness isn't going anywhere. So when this spell is going to be really good is if we can trap creatures in the area. If we cannot trap creatures in the area, they're likely going to flee it. And once they flee it, they're not going to take any damage from it anymore and we can't move it anymore. Now remember, if we are an evoker, we're going to get some advantages here because we can use sculpt spells, which can help protect allies who might be in the area, and we will have empowered evocation, so it'll do a little bit more damage. But neither of those things, I think, are going to be coming up all that often, so I would consider this the same rating for an evoker that I would for the rest of the casters. And that is, it is circumstantial, uh, but I do think it is a better spell than Incendiary Cloud. And in the right circumstances, if you can have opponents who cannot move or get out of an area, I think it could be really effective because we could do a whole lot of damage to them. And then if they can't get out, they will be killed in this area. My next favorite spell at this level is Sunburst. Uh, so Sunburst is more of a basic blast. It is a 60 foot radius blast, so it is massive. Uh, and then what happens is creatures in the area are going to take 12d6 radiant damage. Radiant damage is actually pretty good. It's not easily resisted. Uh, very few things are resistant to radiant damage. Uh, 12d6 damage for the level, eh, it's not great, but it's not terrible damage for the level either. Uh, and then the creature that fails their saving throw are also blinded, and they're going to get a saving throw every round to get rid of the blinded effect. Uh, but that is just an add-on. That's kind of nice. Now, because it is real sunlight, Creatures that have problems with sunlight are going to be affected uh, appropriately, and undead and oozes will have disadvantage on their saving throw against this spell, so it's better against them. Uh, I definitely think this spell's a lot better for an evoker than any other kind of wizard, uh, because sculpt spells is going to be really important here. When you have an area of effect that is 60 foot radius and would have friendly fire, something like sculpt spells makes all the difference in the world. This is exactly the kind of spell where that is going to be a huge if effect for you, because it's going to be hard for other wizards to place this spell if they're already in combat. It's just too big. Uh, but if they're maybe looking down at an army that's far away or they happen to be a fair distance away from the enemy, they still might be able to use it effectively. But once that enemy closes in and gets mixed in with the party, uh, it's going to be really hard to avoid friendly fire here. But of course an evoker can and that's going to be a big deal here. So I would give this an orange rating for most casters uh, just because the damage is okay and there are specific circumstances where this isn't going to be easy to use. Uh, but for an evoker, I'm going to give it a green rating. I think for an evoker, this is exactly the kind of spell that you want. It's the probably the most normal blast spell of this level. It's going to get the advantage from your sculpt spells, your empowered evocation, and sculpt spells is going to be really good here. And this is going to hit all your enemies because the area is so big. So I think for an evoker, this is a reasonably good spell. And I think for everybody else, it's going to be pretty circumstantial. My least favorite evocation spell at this level is telepathy. I don't think telepathy is a terrible spell, but I think the effect is pretty minor for an 8th level spell. Uh, it has an unlimited range, 24 hour duration, you pick a creature, 
and you can speak with it telepathically. Uh, so we can speak with it all day uh, and it might be on the other side of the world. Uh, so for a communication spell, it is unparalleled. But if we're not having creatures on the other side of the world we need to have a telepathic conversation with, we're probably maybe looking at another party member. And then I got to be thinking we could cast a ritual, very telepathic bond and get the entire party without using a spell slot. Uh, doesn't last nearly as long, uh, but if I want telepathy between the party, I can already do it. Doesn't require a spell slot. So this becomes pretty redundant, except in those circumstances that aren't going to happen very often. Uh, so I think telepathy becomes way overly circumstantial. Uh, there are certainly points I could see the advantage of getting telepathy with somebody who is thousands of miles away, but I don't think that's going to come up very often. That brings us into our illusion. There's only one illusion spell at this level, which is a pretty good spell, and that's Illusory Dragon. So when you cast a spell, you have a 120 foot range. You're going to cast it and it's going to create the illusion of a dragon that's going to last for up to a minute and it's going to use your concentration. Uh, the nice thing is, is you create this dragon and any of your enemies that can see it, any of your enemies that can see it from any distance, uh, make a saving throw or they become frightened. Uh, and they remain frightened uh, unless they end their turn in a place where they can no longer see the illusion. And even then, it just allows them to repeat their saving throw. So for a frightened effect, this is just amazing. Uh, also, we can move this effect around. It uses our bonus action, and then we can fly it around on our turn. And when it's moving, we can have it do its breath weapon. Now that breath weapon does pretty crappy damage. But remember, we're already concentrating on this, and it is only using up our, our bonus action. So it's probably something we want to do. 76 damage is not good damage for this level, uh, but we might as well get that 76 damage in addition to the frightened effect, which we're concentrating on this for in the first place. Now I will say that if we get to the point where all our enemies have either made their initial saving throw or been able to get somewhere where they can't see the illusion anymore and then made their saving throw so no one's frightened anymore we don't have a significant number of enemies frightened anymore this probably isn't worth our concentration concentrating on something for 76 points of damage around probably is not worth it uh, and we don't get another frightened effect after the initial casting of this spell so this spell is really about the frightened effect we're going to create this uh, dragon get as many enemies as we can to make a saving throw. It might be a ton of enemies because again, there's no distance beyond the distance of sight for the effect of the spell. And all the ones that fail are gonna be frightened. Uh, and they're going to have a hard time getting rid of that frightened effect uh, as long as you're concentrating on this spell. So overall, I think frightened at this level isn't huge, but that huge area of effect that we're gonna get from this good range uh, and the ability to use our bonus action to do a little bit of damage as well and move the thing around. Never mind the fact that it's a reasonably uh, convincing illusion of a dragon. And although the spell doesn't indicate exactly how that works, I presume there are a lot of things we can do with that as well. Uh, but just in straight mechanical effects, there's enough here for me to recommend it. Uh, and then as well, you're creating a convincing illusion of a big dragon. Uh, so overall, I think this is a good spell. And if illusion's only gonna have one spell at eighth level, I think this is a good one for it to be. So that brings us into our necromancy spells. My favorite necromancy spell at eighth level is clone. Uh, so we can cast clone on ourselves or we can cast on another creature. And it is a one hour casting time and then it creates a clone. And that clone requires 120 days to mature. Once it is mature, then if the creature dies in combat, then it awakens within the clone. So essentially you make it kind of immune to death. Uh, and then we can avoid things like needing to resurrect or if resurrection is not available, then this gives us an alternative. Technically, if we clone the entire party, we become immune to the TPK. Now there are some downsides we need to discuss. The first downside is 
120 days for the clone to mature. Uh, and I've had it mentioned to me, well, what if you cast a wish? Because a wish doesn't have the, the casting time. But this isn't the casting time. This is the spell text. The casting time is one hour. You can change that to one action with a wish spell, but you're not going to change the text of the spell. So it is still going to require that 120 days to mature. So if you don't have that, this is useless. Uh, the second thing is, is if we cast this, let's say we cast this on our entire party. And let's say we have a situation where our fighter dies. Our fighter now appears in the clone. So they're not in the combat anymore. They don't have their equipment anymore. Uh, they may not even have an ability to get back to where you are right away. So suddenly you're in this fight uh, and the fighter is somewhere else. And this must have already been a tough fight because the fighter died in the first place. So that's something to think about as well. In some cases, it's just easier to deal with a fighter that's gone down in combat and they're right there. I mean, even things like a revivify spell might bring that fighter back into the combat right away with one action. Uh, but if you have a clone of that fighter, that's going to prevent that because that fighter now is still alive, but they're somewhere else and in a body that doesn't have their equipment. Uh, now, what I will say is, you might want to consider having a demiplane with your clones in it if you do clones, uh, because that will keep them perfectly safe. Another thing you might want to consider are maybe some spell scrolls or some kind of magic items that you're going to store there with them. So if you awaken within your clone, you have some method to get out and get to where the party is at that time. Uh, so there are some preparation things you can do I think that would make clone more effective. Uh, and the fact that it can just make your party immune to a TPK is still a pretty big deal. Uh, so overall, I still think this is a good spell, but there are some limitations we need to be aware of. My least favorite necromancy spell at this level is Abby Delzim's Horde Wilting. This is not a good spell. Uh, if you remember me talking about Sunburst, which I think is an okay spell, uh, good for evokers, for anybody else, uh, I think it's a little bit circumstantial uh, because it's so big and hard to place. Well, if too big is your problem with Sunburst, then you're going to be happy with Horde Wilting because it covers a small area, 30 foot cube, and it doesn't do Radiant, it does ne Necrotic, which is more commonly resisted, doesn't affect Undead, doesn't affect Constructs, oh, and they're not blinded either. And that's it. Uh, Unless you're targeting non-magical plants, this is really good against non-magical plants. But against everything else, you take a sunburst and you just totally nerf it. And this is what you have left. And this is the same level of spell. Uh, so 12 to 8 damage is moderate damage for the level. Small area, doesn't affect all kinds of things, has no secondary effects. So this is just a bad spell. And so much worse than other spells of this level. So that brings us into Transmutation, our last school. There's only one spell here, uh, and I don't think it is very good either, and that is Control Weather. Uh, now, Control Weather, again, it's going to be one of those spells that if you're dealing with an enemy army, it's great. Yeah, but there's so many spells that are not good, but if you're dealing with an enemy army, they're good. Uh, but for an adventuring wizard, I don't see you taking Control Weather and getting much out of this. This is more about the kind of cinematic thing the enemy wizard is going to do uh, to kind of announce their presence and show you how evil they are. But for a PC, you're not going to get a lot of use out of this. It is going to take you 10 minutes to cast this spell, and then what happens is, is you can change the weather and you change it very slowly. Uh, over an eight hour period, you can change the weather by one step for every D4 times 10 minutes. That's usually 20 to 30 minutes. We can move things from sunny to partially cloudy to fully cloudy to now maybe uh, light showers to heavy rain or uh, in that kind of spectrum. Uh, so then over enough time, we can dramatically change weather conditions, but the amount of time it's gonna take is so huge that this isn't something that is going to impact uh, your standard adventure at all. Uh, I don't see how most wizards in most campaigns are going to make any use out of this spell, period. Uh, so I am not going to give this even an orange rating. I'm going to give it a red rating because I think it's one of those spells that I constantly get told, 
this wasn't really meant for PCs. This was meant for the NPC. Uh, but they put it in the player's handbook and they made it an option for PCs. And this guide is a guide for PCs. So if you are playing a wizard, I would not recommend this spell. And that's it. Those are all the 8th level spells. Next week is the big week, the 9th level spells, and then we're going to get into wizard builds. And I'll probably do a quick primer uh, video where I discuss what those wizard builds are going to be so that you know which one you're waiting for. Uh, until then, I'm going to sit back and relax, and I'm going to have some fun, because D&D is for everyone. Thanks, Optimancers, and I'll see you next time.